Hare Krishna Guru Bro welcome back to the Monks podcast such a Hare pleasure Krishna. to have you always happy to engage in dialogue with you Chaitanya Charan ji Hare Krishna Guru So and now the world yoga day is coming then just to so I thought we could discuss on that topic yoga has become huge in the western world and based on that it is also coming back to india and then there is uh, as devotees you know we are also uh, connecting with the, those who are practicing yoga and then we are also trying to say elevate them to bhakti so there are some people who say that this is just opportunism that yoga and bhakti are two separate traditions uh, so what is the historical and philosophical background for these two traditions are they entirely separate or are they part of a one whole one one larger tradition strands or schools within a tradition can you talk about the historical philosophical background too yes yoga is something that goes beyond the historical eye no one really knows when the practices of yoga really began um it's it goes back thousands of years before it was even called yoga uh it wasn't even called yoga until you know some of the upanishads the later upanishads uh like the uh, shvetashvatar upanishad and katha upanishad and so on so um yoga is something that goes back thousands of years in india it does not begin in china some people have this concept that yoga begins in china no it doesn't it comes from india and it is concurrent with tantra and the vedas so they seem to be a little separate but the vedas speak about meditating yogis long haired bearded meditating yogis who are um sitting in certain uh uh positions asanas um and going into deep meditation aided by some breathing exercises so um that's there in the uh, in the rigveda so the specific so word goes way back yeah. the specific word yogi yoga or yogis is used over there or the description is given or both no just the description not the word yoga okay that comes later so it's it's um it, it's something that goes way back but yoga was essentially meditation and that is ultimately what yoga is the question is on what are we meditating hmm. and that can be many different levels of things um we could be meditating on something that uh is is focusing on the unitive sort of um uh being of of all reality or we could be meditating on a particular supreme being um so you know there are many different levels of yoga perfection and there are many different levels or types of yoga practice and this is what makes yoga difficult to define okay many different practices and many different levels of perfection okay yeah. so just before we go into the yoga practices when you talk about the dates sometimes the devotees are a little un- uncomfortable because there is this constant dichotomy between how the scriptures are dated by academic scholars and how the tradition sees them so right. so essentially we can say that when the academic scholars look about the dating they are looking based on more on the historical evidence that we have yeah. of the particular existence of a particular text but that doesn't necessarily describe when that knowledge itself came all that we can have That's is right. that the written evidence or some other evidence of the knowledge it comes at this particular time that's right it's it and and you know the the empirical academic you know um uh, uh observations that are made about uh spiritual traditions and practices such as yoga are limited because 
again, the historical eye can just reach so far and can just reach so deep. Um, so it's hardly the all in all. It's hardly the whole story. At the same time, it gives us a little bit of perspective. Yeah. Relatively speaking. So the Bhagavata Purana speaks about the Ashtanga system, speaks about yoga, um, and the, especially in the 11th canto, also in the third canto, uh, in the talks between uh, Kapila Deva Devahuti. And um, so, but particularly the 11th uh, canto chapters, I believe uh, 15 uh, and 16, I think so, 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there. So, uh, and then there's mention of yoga throughout here and there. So yoga is something that permeates the spiritual traditions of India. Mm. It is not it is not something that's um, uh, limited in that way. And it, it's it is more of a tool. Uh, it's like a toolbox. Um, you can take a toolbox and build a house, or you can take a toolbox and build a shed. And, you know, there are different things you can build with a toolbox. So yoga is found in so many traditions in India. And now it's found, you know, then it went uh, east to Taoism and uh, and Buddhism. Uh, and it was, you know, well, the Buddha himself took up yoga in India when he was in India. But as Buddhism spread to the east, uh, it took yoga with it and revised it and made it its own. And in modern times, um, you've got uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews practicing yoga. Oh, I'd heard of Christian yoga, but I didn't know about Muslims also. Absolutely. There are select Muslims that practice yoga. Okay. Do I like this metaphor of the toolbox? That's beautiful. That means it's as you said, a set of practices, different people can take whatever they want and it, they don't necessarily uh, all adhere to one philosophy, one theology or one philosophy or in one worldview. So even in the Bhagavatam, you mentioned the philosophical sections where the yoga is talked about. But apart yeah. from that, it, it seems almost uh, every character, they do some kind of yoga, yogic postures. When Yudhishthira yes. announces the world, or even when Prudhu announces the world, they sit in the yoga posture. So, yes. so th that they meditate and they try to distance themselves from their the material elements that make their body. So that would also yes. be an example of a toolbox thing. That uh, they're, they're taking the yoga practice for cultivating inner awareness or focusing on the indwelling Lord, whatever it may be. That's right. So yoga is, it can be a toolbox, just like you, you you dip into a toolbox when you need a hammer, when you need a screwdriver, and when you don't need them, you put them back. Um, it's something that enhances the building of something, right? But at the same time, if one reads the Yoga Sutra carefully, if one reads the Bhagavad Gita correct, you know, carefully, one finds that the ultimate yoga is a perfection is an end. And, and this is also an extraordinary part of yoga and it's worth paying attention to for sure. Yeah. Okay, so we could put it this way. This is a toolbox which and the tools can be used for various purposes. But yes. the toolbox has an original purpose. Yes. So that toolbox was meant to build something. We can use it to build various, various things also. Yes. So, so for example, in today's world, People are using that toolbox or something from that toolbox to make their bodies uh, slimmer and uh, healthier. So yes. that's, you could say that's a more mundane use of that toolbox. But that toolbox had an original purpose. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, you see, the word yoga, in the simplest of terms, means union. Now, union means bringing one thing together with another in a harmonious whole. So that union can take place at different levels. My aching back, oh, my aching back with the rest of my healthy body. I, I go to, to the yoga studio and bring the unhealthy part of my back into a union with the rest of my body, my healthy body in a harmonious whole. 
That's one kind of union. Um, another kind of union is now typically people who come to fix the back problems in a yoga studio, they don't stop. They go, wow, this is something special here. I feel, I feel something extra here. So yoga is always about upliftment, mm. always about elevation. So don't practice yoga if you don't want to be more and more elevated in your human existence, mm. because that's where it goes. Now, um, sometimes, so after the back is fixed, then one can balance more the internal psychical energies, uh, the psychophysical, uh, the psychoenergetic centers of the body, the, the chakras, um, which where we bury uh, the sanskaras and the kleshas, um, the vasanas, the things that, the, the traumas uh, that, that um, limit the energy in our lives. So yoga can help release those chakras. Chakras, a wheel. Mm -hmm. And if you are familiar with driving in a car, when a wheel hits a pothole, it gets the whole wheel off. Can even puncture the wheel. Yoga is about a tire repair, you know? It's about a wheel repair. Allow those chakras to um, circle freely and to be energized freely. So, uh, for example, the 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 third chakra, the Manipura chakra. Sorry, yeah. I just want to understand the examples, beautiful examples. So you're saying that just as a pothole may damage a wheel, so similarly, life's traumas can damage us. And then, That's right. So then the, the, the wheel is damaged, the, the car can't move very well. So similarly, right. because of the samskar, because of the impression, the samskaras created by life's uh, life's unhappy events, yes. like our energies can't move properly. So then right. yoga is like fixing the tire, so it's like fixing the car. Sorry, it's like yeah. fixing the chakras. That's it's right. A striking example. Yeah. yeah. See, we're, we're, we're like vehicles. I mean, of course, the Gita tall calls the body a vehicle, mm. right? A yantra, right? Yeah. So, so it's a, it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a machine, and it has wheels. It has seven wheels, the seven chakras, mm -hmm. and these um, energize. These are psychoenergetic centers, and uh, uh, it, you know, it, it it starts with the bottom of the spine, um, the genital area, the the uh, solar plexus, the uh, the heart area, the, the uh, throat, um, uh, the, the, the forehead, middle of the forehead, and then of course the Brahmarundra, and then, and so there are the seven wheels. Now, if something traumatic happens, like you said, Chaitanya Charanji, if something happens, if a pothole of life comes along, then our wheel gets a bit damaged and it doesn't work as well. Now, of course, we've got the other six wheels working, you know, but there's no such thing as a spare tire. Okay. So you so, so you have to make sure that the wheel gets repaired or it doesn't and it limits us in life. Okay. So yoga is very much a toolbox to repair the tires. Beautiful. Okay. But what's the purpose of these seven tires? Where do the wheels take us where are we going with those seven wheels that's the key and yoga answers that too so that's why you said that the tool toolbox was meant for a particular purpose even yes. though we use it for various purposes that's right and these various purposes needed necessarily be contradictory with the original purpose like you've got the point of union bringing things together so bringing the body together the aching back to work better with the rest of the body so that is a part of a functioning human being then who can actually ultimately fulfill the purpose of life so right. the so the purpose we use it for uh, 
it is not if somebody uses it for say a bodily purpose that is not intrinsically contradictory with the original purpose it may become but, if their life's purpose is entirely different consciously but that's something that's something which is contextual so right yeah so for example it, yeah sorry i mean I, well i just want to point out to tenant energy that that you know you can use part of the toolbox and of you know not engage the rest of the toolbox but then again what you're trying to fix is something very narrow the toolbox is for the whole human being and the development and elevation of consciousness hmm. and ultimately the cultivation of the heart okay so we will fix something very narrow yeah yeah if i just take one tool i might be able to fix only one thing but i right. want the rest of the thing that's that's a nice metaphor so what about when people say use yoga for a purpose which is quite not only different from or smaller than but can then be can it be used for purposes that is contradictory also say for example some people may just use yoga to mint money yoga teaching has become a very commercialized endeavor now it has become commodity yeah. and then it's also used for say I, i've seen when i search for yoga on amazon there are books like yoga for sex now while we could say that uh, karma is also one of the purposes of life dharma artha kama moksha but still that is not that is the progressive vision is nowhere there when people are simply trying to say become fitter or look better for through yoga so that they can attract better partners so would such uses of yoga uh, would we consider them uh, violations of the uh, original purpose of yoga um you know um i can use you know um a hammer to hurt people okay i mean you know i mean that there you know i can use a knife to go hunting and hurt animals Hmm. you know is that the best use of a knife you know yeah. um so again tools can be misused and by the way they tools can be very effective in being misused <laughs> they can be effectively misused <laughs> yes very effectively misused that's right that's right but so so that's why tools need to be in the hands of the right people hmm. um you don't give you don't give a little child a very sharp knife hmm. but when a child does have a sharp knife he or she can well make mistakes they can end up cutting themselves they can end up cutting others not meaning to this is why the guru is so important ultimately the teacher the guide so even in the area of physical postures or that part of yoga also traditionally the idea of a guru and disciple was also there it was not just in spiritual knowledge the guru shishya tradition was also there in the in the aspect of postural yoga well generally you know um uh, asana asana yoga asana for for instance is only one eighth the practice of yoga yes that's true only one eighth of the practice of yoga if you look at it in the ashtanga system spectrum okay now asana would then be something that a teacher might start a student with but asana is called one of the limbs not one of the ladders steps it's not really a ladder it's a limb and you may start on this arm you know heal this arm get this arm strong and then i'll help the rest of the body i mean the arm is attached to my the rest of my body that's a limb so every limb of yoga begins to lead one to other limbs of yoga okay okay sure. so but the whole body of yoga should ultimately not be neglected Imagine if I went to the gym and only worked out this arm, you know? Well, what about the rest? You know, what about the other arm? 
uh, what about your legs? You know, it's incomplete. It's people would think you're crazy. You're only going to the gym to work out one arm. What is this? You know, one of the so, well-known sorry, just to get one of the well-known Bollywood stars. He worked. He did heavy workout for the upper body, so that he could look very good. But then that dam- that heavy workout damaged his body, and then he has to take heavy steroids just to function now. There we go. It's an exaggerated, the exaggerated emphasis on one or two limbs to the exclusion of the other limbs will ultimately produce an imbalance. So you're creating the, an imbalance, which is the very purpose of yoga to, to decrease the imbalances. So you can use yoga to create the yoga. This union. Yeah. It's almost like there is this concept of spiritual bypassing where people use God to stay away from God. That's There you go. Happens all the time. The same way you can use yoga to actually defeat the purpose of yoga. To do as you said. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. True. So do you see that happening extensively in today's yoga practice? Or people who are exploring, they do find something higher and they move on. What is your experience in the... Yeah. Well, I'm, I am, um, I've received a registration and certification with the Yoga Alliance at the highest level, as well as a teacher at the highest level of the yoga community. It's, it's called Yoga Alliance. And... Um, uh, I certainly have enough enough academic initials after my name, but I ended up getting more of these with Yoga Alliance with RYTE, RYT 500, and so on. So uh, so these certifications are good, um, Chaitanya Charanji, because they're, they, they, um, to get them, you have to have a certain training from physiology to philosophy to practice and um, and this is good because yoga can also be dangerous like we talk, talked about with the toolbox. So, you know, um, there have been asana practices in which uh, students will actually uh, break some bones. Okay. It's too much, it's too much. So this is not good, you know, hmm. this is not good. So the training is meant to prevent that kind of thing and to be aware of that kind of, you know, education, yoga education is very important for teacher trainees. So that's going on. That's very good. That's very good. Um, but so, sorry, so in general, you are saying that at least those who get yoga teaching certifications from the yoga, from authorized places or respected sources, they do get a holistic understanding. Now, I, I would say that it moves in that direction generally, okay. yes. Okay. Now, in that training, they're supposed to study the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali and the Bhagavad Gita teachings of Krishna to Arjuna. Oh, okay. So even in the mainstream yoga world, Gita is considered that important as a yoga text also? Yes. Okay. Yes, indeed. And, and so there we find many different yoga practices and many yoga levels of perfection. And that's why it's difficult to define yoga. You know, the funny thing is, Chaitanya Charanji, now I'm coming out with the translation of the Yoga Sutra to be published by Yale University Press. In there, I explain that everyone does yoga. They just don't know it. Really? Okay. In other words, to be a human being means that you already practice the eight limbs. You do it only partially and unconsciously. To be a human being means that there's nothing artificially imposed 
in yoga practice. It's about enhancing the attributes of being a human being in the first place. Would you like me to demonstrate? Yeah, please. That's fascinating. <laughs> okay. So for example, so in the, in the book, I will explain that there's partial yoga, practical yoga, and perfective yoga. Partial? Partial yoga. Yeah, partial, practical, and perfect. The three Ps, I call it. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. Um, now, partial yoga means we're, you're a human being. And there are eight limbs to your human existence, which Patanjali outlines beautifully in the Ashtanga, Ashtanga system. Ashtanga, Ashtanga, eight limbs, right? So the first limb, what is it? The yamas. Yama has to do with uh, perfect ethical practices. The ideal ways that you and I interact with each other and others. What human being is not concerned about how they act, interact with others? Everyone is to a greater or lesser degree. Hmm. Human beings are social creatures. We all want to interact with some other human beings. Maybe that interaction is not always the healthiest, whatever, that's a different matter. But the fact is we are interactive, socially interactive creatures, and therefore the ethical dimension of the human existence is there. So that's the first limb, yama. So I like so that's now you're saying this is a part of partial because different people may have different ideas of how to interact with people. And some people may be able to interact well, some people may interact in a way that simply hurts others and hurts themselves. So that's right. So in that sense, the specific codes of conduct people follow may or may not be the best aligned with reality. That's right. It's aligned with what is best, what is good for them or what is good for both of them. That's right. Okay. But when I move from partial yoga, unconscious yoga, to practical, deliberate practice of yoga, then I take up, I elevate what it means to interact with other people. I start practicing the ideal yogic ethics but we're already ethical creatures. True. We just may not do it very well. Mm. So the limbs reflect the human being and its various dimensions. So those are the yamas. The niyamas come afterwards. And those are the personal practices. The first of which is cleanliness. I mean, I think most human beings, you know, like to be reasonably clean. I mean, this is not... How is this an imposition from yoga? No, I mean, it, everyone likes to be clean. I mean, most people take a bath, I hope, at least once a week, for goodness sake. Uh, I mean, every day would be nice, um, of course. And in other words, human beings feel better when they're clean. We like to be clean. Yeah, again, okay. at least we appear want to appear to be clean. We have at least appear one. And if not, but to literally be clean and to be, yeah. uh, and so on. So there are different levels of, of cleanliness and purity and self practices outlined in the niyamas. Fine. This is universal. True. The yamas are near universal, the niyamas are universal. And then what comes next? Now, notice it's going from outer to inner. So I just sometimes the yamas and niyamas are translated as do's and don'ts. Is that also a valid translation? No, that is not proper. That is not proper. Okay. I'll tell you why. So, so the don'ts, yamas, okay, what they call the don'ts, um, uh, it, the first one is ahimsa. So that's a don't. Don't harm anyone. Hmm. But the second one is satya, truth. That's don't be truthful. Okay. Of course, they take it as implying don't be untruthful, but that, that's not what it says. Okay. The third is asteya, which means don't steal. Okay, don't don't be acquisitive, you know, and 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 taking things uh, that are not rightfully yours. And this could be done on subtle levels or gross levels, whatever. It gets very rich. It's a rich discussion, so that can be considered a don't. But what about the 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 the, the fourth one, brahmacharya? Brahmacharya is a do. 
be be a student of Brahman. You know, uh, you know, be 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 one who who is absorbed in in spirit, in spiritual matters. That's not a don't. That's a do. Now, connotatively, it can mean um, uh, be a celibate. Um, uh, you know, uh, don't be involved in in uh, the, the sexual dimension of, of of being a human. That's connotative, but literally, brahmacharya means be a student of the divine. So they're not all strictly don'ts. True. So you are saying that the the normal meaning of the conversational or conventionally used meaning of brahmacharya is actually second meaning. That a celebrate Third, uh, fourth meaning. Oh, oh, I say. Oh, right. Yeah. Second yes, meaning. that's right. Connotative meaning. The that's right. It's a connotative meaning. meaning. Yeah. So primary meaning is to be situated in or to well, be well, Brahman. Well, the morphology of the word is Brahman, and then Charya. So to be living in the divine. Okay. Yeah. Now the, the 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 implication is if you're engaged in all kinds of worldly you know interactions, uh, 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 bodily interactions with others, then you're it's very difficult to live in the divine if you're uh, you know engaged on a bodily level of things. That's true. okay. Okay. So the idea is that one is living in spirit, and then of course a parigraha, you know, uh, complete non grasping even of things that do belong to you, to not be overly possessive. Okay, so that's a don't. But don'ts and do's is simplistic and not really um, uh, accurate. Okay. So yama means discipline. It doesn't mean don'ts. It means discipline. Things that, disciplines that we practice. So it's a discipline for me to be truthful with Chaitanya Charan. So I'm going to try to be extremely truthful with Chaitanya Charan right now. Okay, so now I'm practicing the second, the second aspect of Yama. Beautiful. Okay. So sometimes okay. disciplines may involve don'ts, and people may feel it that way. Oh, I can't do this, or I can't do this. But discipline itself can also be affirmative, not necessarily restrictive or regulative. Yeah. That's exactly right. And in fact, even the word ahimsa, non-harm, non-violent. I mean, I, I came to a yoga uh, workshop one time and I, I told everyone, I said, look, on the way here, I promise you, I didn't kill anyone. <laughs> so, I mean, on that gross level, I'm practicing ahimsa. But ahimsa goes so much deeper than that. It doesn't mean, and, okay, so non-harm. I wasn't harming anyone, say, with nasty speech. Mm. I didn't like if I call you a goat, Chaitanya Charanji. Okay, this could be very insulting, right? This this could be harmful. You know, Chaitanya Charanji, you're you're just a goat. I mean, th okay, that could be harmful. Okay, <laughs> something like that. So it's on a more subtle level, right? I think on with social media in today's world, this level of himsa happens so much. <laughs> That's right. Fascinating so reputations, and exactly. Yeah. Well, but this is all of the kleshas and the sanskaras coming out, just sort of releasing the endless, you know, machinations of sanskaras and and uh, kleshas. But so so it's so being practicing ahimsa is not merely mm. not calling you nasty names like goat, but it but it means the positive too. It means kindness. Sensitivity, mm, empathy, appreciation of your thoughts and feelings. Mm. So, even though it's put in the negative, ahimsa, non harm, it's also a positive okay. to be sensitive to the thoughts and feelings of others. Mm. So, in the Yama, in the Yama list. The negatives can be understood in terms of the positives. The positives can be understood, in, excuse me, in terms of the negatives, and so on. So it's a rich discussion. Beautiful, yeah. A very rich discussion. But here's the point. Every human being, to some degree, is practicing the yamas. To some degree. Hmm. 
So I didn't, you know, when I went to the store the other day, I, I promise you, I did not steal any bananas. <laughs> okay. But was, but, but was I subtly stealing someone's dignity by thinking of another person and, and putting them down in my mind? That's kind of, that's kind of a stealing, subtle, very subtle. It's a stealing of another person's dignity. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm a bigot, I'm a bigot, and I'm, I'm prejudiced against a, someone of another race. Yeah. That's stealing on a subtle level, but powerful. I'm stealing their dignity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. So, so it, it, there are subtle levels and gross levels to these yamas. So this is the point. Every human being is concerned with their interactions with others to a greater or lesser degrees. Every human being is concerned with their own personal practices. Mm -hmm. um, uh, every, and then the third one, asana. We all have bodies and we're all positioning our bodies. Right now you're sitting, I'm sitting. In fact, asana means literally sitting. Yeah, Vyasasana is the place where Vyasa seat. So the asana. That's okay. right. That's right. Asana, I can be a little crude about this. Asana means what you put your ass on. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. That's pretty much what if you use the British pronunciation, okay? The British pronunciation. So it, it literally means to be um, resting the body in a position, a seated position for what? Meditation. It's preparation for meditation. Okay. So all asana practices, you know, whether it be uh, Tadasana, the Vrikshasana, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Padmasana, all of these, um, uh, you know, uh, Shavasana, it goes on. I mean, they, they've proliferated into the hundreds. But all of them go back to preparing the body so we can go further inward, right? Yamas are very outward. The niyamas are more inward. And now the asana is, is the, the border, the border between the outer and the inner. And now I go to the fourth one, pranayama. I believe all of us are breathing, Chaitanya Charan. As human beings, everyone breathes. True. But do we know how to breathe mm. and oxygenate all 37 trillion cells in our bodies. Yoga, again, enhances, the, the practice of yoga enhances the natural breathing process, the respirational process. Um, whereas in, in partial yoga, we may not take the, the opportunity to really focus on the breath and oxygenate the body fully. Of course, that happens somewhat naturally. Sometimes I go, ah, yeah. okay. So, so I might take a deep breath or I might stretch, right? There's asana, right? Stretching. Ah, uh, even I've seen babies. I've seen infants stretch, okay? Even they stretch. Yawning is a kind of stretching. So these, are, these limbs are all naturally occurring dimensions of the human. In yoga practice, they're deliberately taken up and enhanced. Okay. So in this way- That's the difference. That's beautiful. So we could say, that's why that's you're talking about partial, practical, and perfective. So at a partial yes. level, everybody is doing these things. Everyone. And as we become more conscious, more informed, uh, both in terms of knowledge and awareness, then we will move towards doing it in a more effective way, more yes. and effective way. Yes. Sometimes people say, uh, do you practice yoga, Dr. Schweig? And I say, well, you do, <laughs> but you just don't know it. <laughs> That's beautiful. It's a little bit of an obnoxious uh, response, but I'll say, why are you asking? You practice yoga. Perhaps you don't know it, though. So these eight limbs are all there in every human being. Beautiful. 
So, so pranayama is, is expanding and deepening the breath. Um, pratyahara, the fifth limb, withdrawing the senses from sense objects. Sometimes, every human being at different times wants to sort of retreat from the world of sense, sensate imagery and just go inside. Pratyahara literally means to, uh, to draw from the resources that are within. So that goes deeper. So not to take from without, but to take from within. Prati, to reverse the ahara, the taking, to reverse the taking. Instead of taking from outside in, I'm going to take from deep within and bring it to myself. Oh, okay. I had heard this opposite. It is that we keep taking an ahar from the outside and what is outside, we keep it outside. That's which right. Is, which is one part of it, but that's not the that's emphasis. It's not that's right. the outside outside. It's also rather than taking from outside inside, we keep the outside outside so that we can bring what is inside outside. That's beautiful. That's right. With the ahar. So it can mean both things. Yes. Yeah, so nowadays also the people want so time, some time for now. There's the term that is used: me time. Everybody wants some time for themselves. That's right. That's I want, right. Yeah. I, I need some alone time, or uh, I, I I need to. Uh, what What are some of the expressions? Uh, the romantic expression I, is that I have a date with myself. That's right. I need to chill. I need to, you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. They're different expressions. I can't. They don't come to mind right now. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. But then, and we all love to concentrate on things hmm. like focusing on a novel or philosophy or some group. And we love to be elevated. Human beings love this feeling of levity, of, of, of expanding beyond themselves. Hmm. And that's what great art does. Sometimes sports does that. I remember uh, when my daughter was a miniature human, uh, uh, like a baby human, mm -hmm. right? A little thing like this, right? Well, I mean, you know, her limbs were useless. They, they, she didn't walk. She didn't do it. They, they were useless, as all infants' limbs are, right? In fact, the legs kind of curl up. You pull the leg, it just springs back. You know, okay. But I used to throw her up in the air. Hmm. And she loved Loud. the feeling of levity and cackled wildly. She, all babies would do that. They love that feeling of levity. I want to assure you that I did catch my daughter most of the time. Most of the time. <laughs> I did catch her most of the time. Some of the times it just, I don't know, just, just, she went right through my my arms. So anyway, whatever. But but seriously, mm. that feeling of levity. Now, you know, humans do crazy things for that, right? They go bungee jumping. They go on roller coasters. But sometimes it's more subtle and even more powerful. Sometimes they view art and the the music can be so elevating and, and uh, transporting. Oh, so I'm just saying, so you're connecting levity with the post pratyahar stage of- Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. So in one sense, bungee jumping wouldn't be at all considered to be anything like samadhi, but the idea is that it's just, you just experience yourself beyond your body. So yeah, you're That's doing- it. Yeah. Ecstasis, ecstasy. Standing outside myself. Oh, I didn't know that was the origin, etymological origin of. Ecstasis. Yep, from the Latin, ecstasis, standing outside. There's also a kind of neologism, enstasis, standing even more deeply within oneself. Oh, okay. This is your neologism, or it's uh, actually it's, it's actually it's not mine. It's uh, one, I think, that came from uh, a, a professor of mine at the University of Chicago, way back, not Harvard, but University of Chicago, um, 
Mircea Eliade. I believe he writes about enstasis oh. as well as ecstasis. Yeah. And one of the pioneers in study of religion, isn't it? Yes. Ah, okay. I've read some of, some of the books. Yes. Mm. Okay. So that that is a very in one sense everybody wants these experiences that break the routine and the monotony of life. So it is you could say when somebody does some external activities like when they're going to go for a party and they dance. So in one sense, dance also is gives you experience something different from what we normally get. That's like, right. Yeah. But uh, you could right. these are all you could say partial ways of doing it. But when That's we right. go into samadhi or go toward dhyan dharana samadhi, That's we right. experience this you say, freedom from our from our body selves or freedom from our normal limited self. That's normal right. limitations. You got it. Yeah. That's right. It's freedom. Exactly. It's a freedom to go beyond the normal limits of human existence and to experience something greater. So yoga ultimately can take us to the greatest level of existence. Uh, and, and the Yoga Sutra speaks of this. The Bhagavad Gita speaks of this. But there are different levels for different folks. Hmm. I think maybe now we are coming to so slowly the link between yoga and bhakti. Because I, I, I yes. never did talk about yoga quite a bit. So... So when you're saying if it takes us to the experience of the highest reality, that is where, so there's an organic, you could say like a culmination of yoga in bhakti. Can you put it that way? Yes. In fact, it's and not just I that put it uh, that way or you, but it, the Bhakti Sutra says that and uh, the Bhagavad Gita ultimately says that, that the in the ultimate sense, all our interactive um, levels um, of being a human, all our cognitive um, levels of being a human move into and move out from the affective levels of being a human, which is the heart. Mm. Everything is centered upon the heart and everything emanates from the heart. Mm. So when you use the word effective. Affective. Yeah, affective. Affective. Right. Yeah, affective. Right. So are you using it in a slightly different sense from emotive? Because emotive is related to emotions. They can be at various levels. But when you're affective, you're yes. at the deepest level, our deepest emotions, we can say. Yes. At the deepest level, of the heart, a heart that is uncluttered and not limited by the sanskaras, by the kleshas, by the vasanas, um, there is at the deepest level emotion, and I would like to now make a, a, um, a neologism, and okay. motion. So moving out from the heart and moving into the heart. Okay. Moving outward and moving inward mm. is what the heart is all about. In fact, even the physical heart, the biological heart, has a circulatory system where the blood moves out to nourish the whole body and then it moves back in to be reoxygenated and purified to be able to be sending it out again. So we as humans can contribute something marvelous to this world by acting from the heart, emotion. But we have to make sure that that same heart motion becomes nourished and replenished by N motion. But N motion means what is coming from, we also need nourishment from outside. We learn from others. We learn from nature. We, we are social creatures. That's what you are referring to. Well, well, it, it is. A, we have to learn how to be nourished by other hearts, and maybe the supreme heart. Oh, okay. 
So at this level, we're talking about a purity of existence, a purity of affect, a purity of the heart, a pure love, the kind that Krishna offers Arjuna in the Gita. Beautiful. The divine is already embracing us. The divine has been embracing us for an eternity, Chaitanya Charan, as you know, mm -hmm. through uh, outwardly, uh, an embrace from without, from within, from everywhere around us, and now, right in front of us, the divine waits for the full embrace, the return embrace from us. Yoga is the return embrace of a divine embrace that's already been there, but we're not returning it. You know, my grandmother, she loved me a lot, okay? My family used to go up and visit my grandparents in New York City. They lived on Fifth Avenue. They lived in an apartment. And we used to go down the hall and go up in the elevator. And my sister would be there as well, my younger sister. But my grandmother had a special thing for me, right? So I was eight years old. And when that door flung open, my grandmother looked at me with wide eyes and attack arms, and she would come and I would hide behind my mother, you know, grabbing onto her skirt. And she would come and squeeze me like a boa constrictor. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> and, 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 and I could hardly breathe, right? And I would even mouth the words to my mother, help, right? Okay, now, divinity is not as aggressive as my grandmother. <laughs> okay. It's gentle, but it's far more thorough than my grandmother's embrace because it's everywhere. We just don't appreciate it yet. Yoga is about evolving greater and greater levels of sensitivity. Sensitivity to other human beings, but beyond that. Sensitivity to all living beings, but beyond that. Sensitivity to the uh, reality of existence that engulfs us. Sensitivity ultimately to the very thing from which all reality comes and emanates. Sensitivity to the inner life, the inner life of God. Mm. So, you know, we talk about yoga as harmony, but I never connected the idea of harmony with embrace. It's such a moving and loving imagery. Harmony, can some, harmony is also very sweet, or connection is also very sweet, but embrace has that aff affective part within it, very yes. powerfully. But, but, but let's talk about it even more ontologically. What is an embrace? An embrace is something that engulfs us, something that supports us, something that holds us up. So yes, I mean, you can bring it to a kind of almost romantic level, right? A kind of, uh, or, or, you know, a affective, loving level. Okay, but I'm, I'm really using it to talk about something metaphysical here. Oh, okay. Chaitanya Charan, your body consists of about 37 trillion cells. Mine does too. How is it all working? Are you doing anything to help it? There's so much that's happening to us and for us even to make it possible for you and I to speak. This is so miraculous. If we could comprehend the miraculousness of all this, we, we would be stunned and we wouldn't be able to talk at all. 
within each of those 37 trillion cells, Chaitanya Charanji, there are a million working parts. Are you doing anything to help? Very, just kind of breathing calmly, right? You're not doing much. <laughs> we are supported. We are embraced. Everything around us and in us makes this life possible. We're being embraced, supported, nourished all the time without much effort on our part. Hmm. So when you said yoga is increasing sensitivity, it is becoming aware of how yes. much something beyond us is sustaining us. Yes, mm. upholding us, sustaining us, nourishing us, giving so much to us. That's an embrace. And then we naturally, if we become aware of that, we will naturally want to know what is that reality? What is it that is embracing us? Yes. So, so now you are- well, what, if I, what if I give you, what if I send you endless gifts in the mail? And I send you a this, and I send you a that, I send you you know, a new, a new korta, I send you a watch, I send you rings, I send you hats. I, I shower these gifts on you and I never hear even so much as a thank you. That's the human condition. We are not grateful. Mm. We're not appreciative. We have so many gifts, more gifts than we can even conceive of. Yoga is about being increasingly more grateful and appreciative and sensitive to all the gifts. This is such a this beautiful uh, explanation of yoga from a conceptual perspective. Mm, it just broadens one's consciousness. Uh, how much of it is, uh, you could say, explicated in the core yoga texts or it's implicit and then we, we draw it out how, because the, from what I've seen, the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, it's not a very... It is not a very big text, first of all. It's smaller than the Bhagavad Gita also. And also, yes. its sutras are very, very terse. Yes. And it doesn't really talk much about the nature of the ultimate reality. So it seems to... Oh, oh. No? That's because you haven't read my translation yet. Okay. Mm. Okay, when I say it doesn't talk much, it doesn't explicitly talk about a personal divinity like Krishna or anyone in the in the way he is, is talking about in the Bhagavatam or somewhere else. But you can, okay. I'm saying in that sense, but you can explain. Okay. It does talk about Krishna, but it talks about Krishna or divinity in more neutral terms, in more empathetical descriptive terms. So, for example, Ishwara, typically people will translate it as God. What does that mean? I don't know what, well, I mean, that could mean anything to, to, to a Westerner in, in the West, 82% of people in the West identify God as the creator of the universe. But in bhakti traditions, it goes way beyond creation. Creation is something subcontracted out. Okay. <laughs> it's given to someone else to do. He's too busy. <laughs> to, to deal with cosmic creation, cosmic dissolution. That's just, that, that, that's, to, look, hey, you do that and you do that, you know. No. Divinity, Ishwara. I translate Ishwara not as God or Supreme Lord. Supreme Lord is a better translation, but, but I've translated it, um, well, the way I'm currently translating is the divine source of all reality. Beautiful. Isha Vara 
it breaks down morphologically to mean that quite easily. Isha vara. Ishwara pranidana is this famous phrase from the Yoga Sutra. Appears five times. Or is it four? Five. I believe it's five. And typically, people translate it in this limp way. Dedication to God or devotion to God. But what is that? What does that mean? Take the word morphologically apart. Pranidhana. Moving pra deeply ne into the space within the heart. Dhana. There is where you will discover Ishwara. Beautiful. So, so the divine source of all reality is discovered by moving deeply into the space within the heart. Dhana, the core. And that phrase, space within the heart, Kridayakasha, is there in the Upanishads in many places. So I'm showing some intertextual relationship there. Okay. Into the space within the heart. Space within the heart. So here is space used uh, in the in what's Rid Akash. Akash. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, of course, we're not talking about the biological heart, but yet there's so many parallels because, you know, the heart, the biological heart has four spaces. Okay. The atria, two spaces for the atria, and the ventricles, two spaces. Mm. There is space within the heart, the physical heart. But we're talking about the heart of a soul. Have you noticed in the Bhagavad Gita that suddenly we find out that Ishwara is present within the heart? But whenever we talk about the whole human being, we talk about Atman, we talk about Ahankar, we talk about Buddhi, we talk about Manas, we talk about the Indriyani, we talk about the Deha or the Sharira, right? From subtle to gross. So where's the heart? Where's, where is it, Ch Chaitanya Charan? Suddenly we learn that Krishna is within the heart. Where, 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 I, wait a minute. I didn't see it in that list. Where is it? Is that referred to the same as the, like the center of our emotions? It's ultimately the soul. We presently, wherever our emotions are in the mind or wherever, that's where it will be located. Something like that. You know, the Gita says that you can stop the mind from within the heart. Wow. Yeah, I think this is, that's one of the most enigmatic verses, 8.8 <laughs> 8. 8 or something like that in the Gita. That, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. One of the reasons I love our talks, Chaitanya Charan, is I love seeing what happens when I load all these unusual ways of understanding these depths of philosophy. Mm. So I love trying these things on you. I really do. Now, uh, <laughs> so, Mano Rudi Nirudhya it is. Yes. Yeah, it's, fixed, uh, it's a very fascinating. So what, 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 so within Sankhya, there is no place for the heart. So what does it refer to? The heart is even deeper than the soul or the Atman or the self, because it is it, because it is within the heart that the Atman resides, according to the Upanishads. I have loads of quotes from the Upanishads. Okay. The 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 Atman resides within the heart. Not only that, it is within the heart and through the heart that the city of Brahman exists. Okay. 
So there are macro, meso, and micro levels to understanding the heart. And I call it the whole hyphen heart, the whole heart. Oh. And this brings together everything, Chaitanya Charanji. The 13th chapter, the Kshetra Gya. Who is that knower? Do you know who's doing the knowing there? Do you know what is doing the knowing? Ultimately, it's the heart, not merely the Atman. You know, the word Atman comes from a root, a verb root, which means breath. Okay. And so Atman is sort of like a parallel to the respiratory system. Okay. And the respiratory system is very, very important to the body. Right? Hmm. But what is it a servant of? The heart, the biological heart. It serves the heart. It oxygenates the blood so that when the blood circulates, it can oxygenate the rest of the body. The blood carries the oxygen to the rest of the body. And then the blood that's been used comes back to the heart, it becomes purified. It then goes back into uh, uh, the exposure to the lungs, to the to the respiratory system. It gets rejuvenated and then goes around the body again. Mm. This is what happens spiritually. The, the heart is at our deepest, deepest center, and yet it's the whole being, like a circulatory system. Are we considering here the heart to be the thing that radiates out awareness or consciousness? Yes. Yes. And we can do an experiment here. You can stop your breathing. You can hold your breath well, for what? A minute? Two minutes? But try stopping your heart for that long. Now, I don't want you to die. Okay? So, <laughs> I happen to be very fond of you. Okay? So, I really don't want you to die, but trust me, you cannot have your heart missing, skipping a beat. Mm. The lungs, you can, look. I'm holding the breath. Am I dying? No. But if I were to have my heart, if I could have my heart withhold the beating, I would die. The heart, it, even biologically, is more fundamental than even the breath. We are going a little, quite a deep here into the discussion about the heart. It's beautiful. So, yeah, but you know, but you know why, Chetan Jaranji? Hmm. Our discussion of yoga is ultimately about the heart, the whole heart, the whole human being. See, there's no, there's no way to refer to the whole human being. When we speak about the Kshetra Gya, we're talking about the knower of the sphere hmm. of interaction, the sphere of awareness. The heart is ultimately more of a knower than the manas, than the indriyani, the manas, and the buddhi. Because it includes all of those and goes beyond. Premanjana chodita bhakti velo chanena santasra daiva hridayeshu velo kayanti. Beautiful. It is by seeing through the heart in the heart, Hridayeshu, right? It's locative case. Mm. They see through their hearts what? Shyama Sundarama Chintya Gunaswarupa. We can know that which is practically unknowable. A chintya unknowable. Gunaswarupa, the essential nature and qualities of the divine. 
Ultimately, it's the heart that knows, not the buddhi, not the mind, not the senses. And when we attain a spiritual body, which by the way, the Yoga Sutra talks about. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Bodiless beings, bodiless beings. Now, why do they become, why do um, embodied beings become bodiless? Because their hearts become so full of purest love that it can no longer be contained within the physical body. So it's not so much a could say a state of disembodiment, which talks about like a deprivation of the body. It's more a state of freedom from that which is insufficient for expressing the heart's love. That's it. Khridaya Purnam. Mm. Khridaya Purnam is a phrase of mine. Heartful? Yes. My heart, a, a, a fullness. It's a Tatparusha Samasa. So it's a fullness of heart. You could coin a word like we are mindful. You can have heartful. Yeah. Well, yeah, heartful sounds yeah, fullness. I like fullness yeah. of heart or 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 full heartedness. As I say in the my Gita translation, uh introduction, I believe, or um somewhere in there, I talk about full heartedness. That's more complete. Just heartful is is a bit simplistic. I or if I if I truncate it further, then I'd say the whole heart. Hmm. So we started with Ishwar Pranidhana and you're yes. talking about how ultimately it's like you go within Pranidhana to find the Ishwar over there. That's right. And it's up to you who you discover there. If you discover Krishna, well then, wow. Arjuna discovered Krishna. Now when you say it's up to you who you discover there, that means... There is both, there is an objective and subjective aspect to it. Objectively, the Lord is there in the heart. But yes. subjectively, depending on our samskaras, our vasanas, we may find something else over there. Is something that has been placed over there by our own past actions. Is it, in one sense, in the word God, you didn't, we don't use the word God as Ishwara, but everyone has a God. Everyone has something that is the center of their being. And it's the highest. Yeah, that is, that, that is ultimate, yes. And in their worldview, that is the ultimate. For some people, it might be money. For some people, it might be their health. For some people, it might be their family. Some people, it might be their country. So you're saying that if, if those people go deep into their being, it's up to them what they will find. That's right. And this is how we can also understand Krishna when he says, Ye thamam prapadyante. Like, as That's right. As all to me, they will reciprocate. I'll reciprocate. That's right. Exactly. Beautiful. So it is that same Krishna, but in a sense, if this is what you think is the ultimate reality, this is what you will find over here. So Krishna also said, Naham Prakasha Sarvasya. I am That's not right. to everyone. That's right. Okay. So to what extent does the Yoga Sutra actually give a give an understanding of what the Ishwara is? You said that Ishwara Pranidhan comes several times. Yes. But so is the is the Yoga Sutra more about practice than about the vision of perfection or the vision of perfection, as you said, is also given? To what extent? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's more of a kind of outline of practice and perfection as well as the conditioned state of partial practice, right? Partial application of the limbs. It's more of an outline and you're supposed to fill in the outline. Now, if you want to, you can practice yoga in a way that takes advantage of the facility of yoga, greater health, greater uh, 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 sort of um, uh, intellect, uh, intellectual capacity, um, greater awareness. It's kind of like this. Mm. Right. Yeah, have you ever seen those bicycles? 
that you write on and they're in place. Exercise. They don't go anywhere. Exercise bikes. Exercise bike. That's it. Yeah. So you're riding on an ex Now there's nothing wrong with an exercise bike, but you're not going anywhere. Okay. So you're gaining strength, but you're not going anywhere. Hmm. So, you know, you can also, you know, you can gain strength and you can, you know, be uh, exceptional in terms of your mind, in terms of your health and to, but, but where does all of that go? Where's it all going? Now, it just so happens that the arranger of existence schedules our bodies to deteriorate at greater or slower rates of speed. Hmm. I mean, Chief Tenant Chart, I never wore glasses when I was young. Never. I had beyond perfect vision. 2020, I had 2015. I had the vision of a hawk. Oh. But when I got older, my external vision started needing some supplementation. The arrangement for the body to deteriorate works with the assumption that there's another body that's being formed. Okay. That there's a greater vision within that no longer depends on so much vision without. That's yoga. Oh, so you're saying that in one sense, yoga is meant to be, it's the fabric of reality pushes us toward the practice of yoga or the fabric of reality is arranged in a way as to inspire us or even it assumes that we will move toward yoga. That's right. Hmm. Things are arranged for us to either ignore the opportunities in our existence or to take advantage of them, to work with the cycle of life as one is deteriorating, as one's body is slowly fading, as the sunlight of our bodily existence begins to reach sunset. Are we prepared enough to where we can ra raise the full moon of spiritual existence. Beautiful. Or is it only a new moon that needs to cycle around again and again and again until we arrive at the full moon, Purna Chandra? It's such an amazing metaphor. It's just so intuitive also. Yeah. It, yeah. So, so we could say the full moon is rising. That's when one has, uh, you could say, fully returned the embrace and fully envisioned the reality with whom, to whom we are embracing. Yes. The moon reciprocates with the sun. Okay. Moon reciprocates. That's true. But when it's very, you know, hardly, when it's a new moon, it doesn't reciprocate very well. Mm. It doesn't shine back. But the full moon shines back. Now, nothing can be as bright as the sun, but in our own little infinitesimal ways, we can return the embrace of the divine. Mm. So things are arranged for us to practice yoga, no matter what, uh, either unconsciously or deliberately and consciously, and then to attain the perfection of yoga is to be completely absorbed without any trace of conditioning. How is it that someone can rise 
so high in the practice of yoga and fall from that into worldly treachery. We've seen this. Hmm. I'll tell you how, according to Patanjali, there's something called Sabija Samadhi, Sampragyata Samadhi. Hmm. Now, Sampragyata Samadhi is the positive way of talking about it, but, and there's no such thing as a Sampragyata, uh, but people impose it on the, the Yoga Sutra, which is incorrect. I won't go into that now. You'll have to read the book. But Sabija means with seeds. The seeds of our samskaras? And or seeds seed? are, yes, seeds are little traces of imperfection that if not addressed and not taken care of, you know what seeds can do. They can grow into full-fledged plants hmm. and grow one right out of samadhi. and grow us right back into the conditioned world. So going back to the embrace metaphor, that whom we are embracing depends on which bija is growing. If some unwanted bija is growing, then that embrace gets misdirected towards something else. So instead of, we are about to, yeah, we are about to embrace the divine, but we end up embracing something else. Yes, we could be embracing something lesser. Now, remember, everything is part of the divine. Yeah. Okay. So okay. the problem is we don't realize that, you see. So uh, the divine realizes that, but we don't realize that. Mm -hmm. So we see it separate from the divine, even though we see it maybe as in an ultimate sense. And that's why we're in the conditioned world. We're here to find out what it means to discover ultimacy in the truest and ultimate sense, the ultimate ultimacy. Yeah, I thought you would say intimacy, but you said ultimacy. Okay. Intimacy comes later. That, that, that comes, you know, yes. The, the intimate divinity, that comes later. That's when you have truly found the ultimate ultimate. And then you dive into that ultimate, you join it, you become part of it, and then you become intimate with the ultimate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's right, it's there. <laughs> that's right. You know me well, Chaitanya Charanji. That's right. It's something like in Krishna Lila, we talk about say first, there's God's greatness and there's God's sweetness. Uh, so. It's ultimacy. First, we understand the ultimacy, and then there is intimacy. Mm. Aishwarya versus Madhurya. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. So, yes. so when you're talking and, about... And, and by the way, Aishwarya is a strengthened form in Sanskrit of Ishwara. Right? Oh, okay. Aishwarya, Ishwara. Right? Mm. So, Aishwarya... Um, so Ishwara contains both the intimate divinity and the uh, majestic and or uh, powerful divinity, Isha being at the center and Vara at the circumference. The circumference is the all embracing, you know, it's, it's all of reality, but the Isha is at the, at, the, at the center. And if one is connected deeply with Isha, then Isha turns into Bhagavan. Mm. the intimate so, yeah, divinity so, so the majestic lord reveals himself to be the intimate lord you could say. Yeah. yes and while the IGS, the Aishwarya and the majestic are always there but when one is intimately relating to divinity of course as you know mm. one forgets about the Aishwarya but when one is feeling isolated or separate and, and, and is missing the, the, the beloved uh, deity, divinity, uh, as in Viraha or Vipralambaseva, then one remembers the Aishwarya, just as the gopis in the Gopi Gita, 
when they're they 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 were searching for Krishna everywhere, and then they just sat in the forest in the middle of the night, and they sang nineteen verses together of Viraha, Vipralamba Seva. You know, it's funny. The word Vipralamba means the attainment of distance. It's an attainment. Okay. Okay. So it's the, an attainment because this state of intense feeling alone and far away, viraha, vi, far away, raha, alone, viraha, alone and far away. This experience just brings divinity even closer. But in that feeling of viraha, you see that the Vrajagopikas, they acknowledge Krishna's divine, as Prabhupada would put it, opulence. Or, or his majesty, his powerful uh, Prakash. But also at the same time, talks about the intimate dimensions of divinity. And in talking about both, you see, the Aishwarya cultivates feelings of humility and dainya. Whereas talking about the intimate aspects uh, develops uh, ragatmika sentiments, mm. passion. So this humility and passion, as you know, I never talk about humility without talking about divine passion because you cannot have one without the other. And this is exhibited in the behavior of the virtue gopikas. So this is yoga. It's the yoga of the yoga of the yoga. Why the triple the yoga of the yoga of the yoga? <laughs> uh, triple only because yoga at one level reaches the horizon of being. Sat. But if it goes higher, it can reach a, the, 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 the rise of chit and then the ultimate rising of ananda. Oh. And the inner life of that Ananda, of the, of the divine. Oh, so in that sense, Satchit Ananda. Yes, right. Oh, so one level of aware perfection of yoga is also to realize the Sat aspect that there is yes, this is eternal, and that's right, pure existence. Okay, so yoga of the yoga of the yoga. Okay, mm -hmm. and this so this is this is where bhava. One realizes bhava, being. Um, one realizes the foundational horizon of being. Yeah, I was thinking sometime we really should discuss the Gopi Gita and the Ras Lila in detail. We have, we have, yes. we have mentioned it in many beautiful ways in our various podcasts, but we could need to have a devoted discussion to that. Yes. But just coming back to this point about Satchit Ananda, so is it when the yogis realize the sat aspect and if they consider that to be the ultimate, is that why there is a common, common notion, I would say, about yoga that yoga talks about Ishwara as uh, the, the perfection as contentless or objectless consciousness. And it talks about, so is this based on scripture? The two things, and I, I, maybe these are the two things which we will, we will need to conclude because this will take some time. One is yes. the idea of what is the perfect stage of consciousness? That is it contentless, objectless? And why is it thought like that? Is it because of, say, the Advaitic tradition superimposing or something? And the other is that, mm -hmm. that the conception of Ishwara is often thought, thought of more as a not the ultimate being who reciprocates, but as more as an exemplar. So is mm -hmm. that something which came from Jainism or Buddhism that they are that they're also the ultimate being, the Tirthankars are more like models than, than lords who reciprocate. So where, because these ideas seem to be quite widely associated with the yogic conception of perfection. Yes. Yes. Well, you see, now the Buddhist and the Jain and the uh, uh, Bhakti conception of existence are different. Yes, very different. 
in many ways. So in the Gita, really, when we talk about sattva, we talk about existence in the sort of, shall we say, um, I wouldn't say impersonal sense. It's just non-personal. It's not very personal. So in other words, that means the kind of interconnectedness of all things resting in the divine is Krishna. Okay. I mean, you know, if I come to your house, I'm not going to see it as a kind of empty nothing. No, it's still your house, but it's not you, Chaitanya Charan. Hmm. If I tell you I come and I came over to your house, I didn't want to see you. I just want to see your house. Well, okay. <laughs> for some <laughs> yogis, <laughs> you know, for some yogis, that's okay. <laughs> or, or, or let me put it this way they don't reject it's not like rejecting Chaitanya Charan it's that all they can comprehend at that time and it's beautiful is the house wow they can be wowed by the mansion of existence beautiful. wow okay so that's okay and, you know, we talk about Shukadev being an impersonalist or the four Kumaras being an impersonalist. They're not impersonalists in the Maya body sense. They understand that there's something more to it, but they prefer to stay at this more peaceful, interconnectedness, unitive mm. state of things. It's beautiful because I like this word non personal as compared to impersonal. Because it Correct. conveys a rejection of the personal. Correct. Yeah, whereas non-personal is, you could say maybe lack of awareness, lack of realization, lack of perception of the. That's right. And I also like this: the wowed by the mansion of existence. It's beautiful phrasing. And before I was yeah. introduced to bhakti, uh, I had read some spiritual teachers, and their descriptions of Brahman were actually very moving. Just as oh, very. I, just yes. as just as we feel moved by hearing the beautiful descriptions of Krishna. Yes. The descriptions of, we could we could say that there is no Krishna. In that sense, it's it's not personal. But, That's right. But there is, there is the affective aspect also involved. It's not just like a cognitive aspect. The description is very beautiful and moving for them. Yes. So, hmm. And this comes from the Upanishads. The Upanishads, uh, which are, you know, I mean, the Gita is considered Gita Upanishad. Hmm. Okay, so it's an Upanishad, and and this teaching is not unaligned with the other Upanishads. No, it's all right there. And when we talk about the city of Brahman, a city is not a nothing place. A city is very active. It's very full. Hmm. Very beautiful, if it's a beautiful city, of course. Um, so, you know, the idea here is that. No, we're not talking about emptiness. We're talking about the opposite. We're talking about fullness of being. Now, fullness of being at that point is more passive. It's more, you know, um, sort of, uh, shall we say, uh, reverentially oriented. Mm. Okay. Whereas being within supreme being is a supre is the supreme being so sometimes people need to see the mansion of existence first and say who lives there who lives in that house and then they get to know ah that's who lives in that house and you know what? Once you get to know the person in the house, of course, you're amazed at the whole house, but you don't focus on the whole house. You focus on the loving relationship within the house. Once we know the person, it is, it is not that we are, we are we may be aware of the house, but the house, in one sense, we, the center becomes the person. It's that's right. Like we say, Krishna, it is said, Bhushanam Bhushitaha. Right. He is the ornament of ornaments. 
That's right. So, so that, from a devotional perspective, so even the Brahman is like an ornament of Krishna. We don't see right. it as disconnected. It's, the appreciation, like in the tenth canto, there are the verses where that that Brahman whom the jnanis seek, that Paramatma whom the yogis seek, that he's playing as a boy in the courtyard of Nanda Maharaj. How fortunate is Nanda Maharaj? Right. So that there you go. It's like when you know the mansion, you appreciate the owner of the mansion more. That's that's right. But at the same time, the the mansion recedes. And the 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 loving exchange is everything. Beautiful. Um, That's true. I mean, even in human relationships, uh, I have a very wonderful relationship with my wife. She's a real partner in life and everything in my devotional and my yogic life, everything. We we could live in a hut, or we could live in a mansion. That's secondary. If there isn't the affection there, then what is the use of any kind of living space? Hmm. So similarly, the divine mansion may be dazzling at first, but that can't sustain us. It's what's between hearts that sustains us. That is bhakti, and that is the yoga of bhakti, which ultimately translates as rasa. Yoga is a code word in the ultimate sense as rasa. Beautiful. So if you consider yoga as connection, then what connects the human and the divine is actually rasa. There it is. Beautiful. This is why Prabhupada, you'll see yoga in the verse, in the Gita, in the word for word, even though some people can't read Devanagari. So it's in the transliteration and it's in the word for word. Then Prabhupada has the audacity to put devotional service in the verse. Yeah. <laughs> and, people, and people don't know why. I said, you don't understand. Prabhupada is seeing the ultimate, ultimate achievement of yoga as rasa. And devotional service is the human response to that divine embrace. But you don't see that. So Prabhupada is fast-tracking the reader in the Gita. Beautiful, fast-tracking. That's such a nice word. I That's right. The same thing that the Prabhupada, is, his compassion makes him impatient. It's like he wants to give throughout the Gita what Krishna is giving at the conclusion of the Gita. That's right. Fast tracking. That's right. Yeah. That's the same thing. Fast tracking yeah. and uh, yeah, that's right. Beautiful. Placing the conclusion in the in these in the steps. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so you, so you explain that the non-personal conception is a progression. It's like seeing the vision. It's seeing the seeing the mansion before we come to see the person. Now. So then where is the idea that the, okay, I'm seeing the mansion and I see the person also, but why should, why would I think the person to be more an exemplar than a reciprocator? Is that, where does that idea come from? That, because you, we cannot, in the Yoga Sutra, cannot deny that, as you said, Ishwara is prominent. And it's not just, although it's, you could say it's one limb of, one limb of yoga, but his position is much, much more than that. Yes. So how how does Ishwara get sidelined to an exemplar rather than the as a reciprocator? How did it happen? And I mean, is it uh, is it also they're not they're 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 not interpreting the whole the Yoga Sutra in text in, in the Samadhi Pada first part mm. text um, uh, aphorism forty one. It speaks about how the meditator is grasping the divine. And how the divine um, uh, is is anointing, effectively anointing the meditator. It's a raw concept of grace. It's beautiful. It, the, the meditator is described as, as grahitra, the grasper, grahitra. And there's the grahana, the grasping. And this you could translate it even as embracing. 
the so the embracer, the embracing, and then that which is to be grasped, grahya, mm -hmm. and it's all it's so strongly implied the one most powerful word in Sanskrit for grace is anugraha. Beautiful. Look at that. The, and anugraha means that which follows the grasp, the embracing. So when we go to the, the divine to grasp and embrace the divine, returns the grasp, anugraha, that's called grace. Now, anugraha is not the word mentioned there. Rather, what is talked about there is there is a process of anjanata. Anjana, anjana means ointment. And ta is the abstract suffix. So ointment, it, it, it means a massage. The, the meditator is massaged by the divine. That's why you said anointed, okay. Yeah, anointed. By the divine, beautiful. It's right there in the, in the direct literal translation. Now, you know how many people translate the, the Yoga Sutra in, you know, remote kind of, you know, metaphorical, they try to, you know, twist it around. Well, if you don't want to take the Yoga Sutra seriously, you just do whatever you want with the text. I translate it literally and deliberately for what it says. Mm -hmm. And there is a raw concept of grace. And the whole first pada builds up in the first 22 aphorisms, builds up to this idea of, of, of the purusha, the human purusha, um, ultimately arriving at the perfection of Ishwara. There's something beyond the sampragyata state of samadhi. And usually what they all say is there's the state of asampragyata, but that's not there. They're doing that and diverting one away from Ishwara. Ishwara is what Patanjali presents as the state beyond the he calls it the other state beyond sampragyata is Ishwara Pranidhana. There is no explicit reference to asampragyata samadhi at all in the. No, no. My God. Is the, they're simply stating that there's a state beyond sampragyata. That state beyond sampragyata is Ishwara Pranidhana. And everyone speculates and says, oh, it's the asampragyata. There's no asampragyata. There is no asapragyata. Hmm. So it's not according to Patanjali. Okay. So that's where the idea comes up that sampragyata, you are having an object for your meditation, but you go beyond, that means there is no object. That's where the that's the inference that is being drawn over there. That's why the idea of and they're and they're incorrect. Hmm. There is Ishwara. When you've gone beyond sampragyata, the other anya, anya, the other state, beyond. Sampragyata is Ishwara Pranidhana. It's right there. Wait till you read my translation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's it's going to be groundbreaking when this insight comes out because just like the in Yoga Sutra has been co-opted by impersonalist Advaitin yogis. And just as you have brought out the the love, the love aspect in the Bhagavad Gita, I think you're going to bring it out in the Yoga Sutras. But, but it's there. I can't help it. And the Vibhuti Pada, all these different translators think that the Vibhuti is the Vibhuti of the Yogi. No. The word Vibhuti is not used in relation to the Yogi. It is only divinity that has Vibhuti. As an ekapad vibhuti, tripad vibhuti, vibhuti belongs to Ishwara. And the siddhis are a manifestation of how the buddhi can spill over a little bit into the life of a yogi. And these miraculous things can happen only because of the yogi's close proximity to divinity and the vibhuti of divinity. 
but the yogis do not have vibhuti. Oh, okay. Vibhuti is singular. Siddhis is plural. You can have siddhis. Look, I mean, come on. How powerful are yogis anyway? Come on. They all die. Have you ever known a yogi to just keep going on? No, they all die. Yogis in this world, it doesn't matter how many cities you have in this world. Patanjali is talking about Vibhutipada. Why does he even bother with the Vibhutipada? Because he wants to show the glories of divinity, not the glories of the power of the, of the yogi. Beautiful. That's why. And you know what's funny, Chaitanya Charanji? There's very little commentary by many yogis who do a yoga sutra under the vibhutis, because uh, under the vibhuti upon, uh, the texts, because they're embarrassed about how powerful, you know, the, how, how <laughs> they don't know what to say. I mean, okay. But it's not, it's not the power of the yogi. Mm. It's the power of divinity that can sometimes spill over. That's beautiful. When you said that spillover, I was thinking of 1041 in the Gita. Krishna says, everything opulent manifests a spark of my splendor. There yeah. you go. There you go. The only reason there's such beautiful, splendorous things in this world is because of something unimaginably extraordinarily, exquisitely beautiful in the eternal sense. Beautiful. This is the vibhuti. Mm. So then, is, does, the yoga, does the sutra also talk about something beyond the chitta vritti nirodha? Because that is given as one definition of yoga and that also seems to indicate some kind of stasis that, that the consciousness has become nirodha. So, can we talk this or do we need to have another session to talk this? Well, that that could be a whole other, because I do not translate yoga chitta vritti narodaha the way most people do. And this is what I'm working on right now. Chitta is a word that can mean mind, it can mean thought, it can mean consciousness, it can mean heart. I translate it as hridaya purna, the whole heart. So, what is my translation of it? Uh, we can perhaps end on this. Leave it. Leave. Leave your listeners absolutely stunned by what they could learn from all of this. And here it is. It reads like this. I read it as a double entendre. Okay, so that means I'm double translating vritti narodaha. The first instance in which you hear the translation it's a negative one in the second it's positive and you'll hear it right now yoga is a transformation of the whole heart as its conditioned turnings become uprooted so its pure turnings can take root and flower beautiful Nirodha, vritti, turnings. What kind of turnings? They're either conditioned turnings or they're pure turnings. Nirodha is either uprooting or taking root and flowering. So, oh. And this, you see, ni means root, rota means blossom, flower, growing upward. So this is supported by the uh, by two other key texts. One in particular in which the word Naroda appears three times. Naroda, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Naroda Sanskara. So that's the uh, the uprooting of the Sanskaras. Uh, Naroda uh, uh, Paninama, the transformational process of Naroda. And Naroda uh, uh, Chinmaya. So I think it's uh, Chinmaya. I forgot exactly. Anyway, and that's the, neuro, the transcendent, the, the flowering of the garden of yoga. Flowering of the garden. So that, that expression is also there. So yeah. we cannot, so Nirod cannot be reduced to one thing. And this is such a, what you're doing is a beautiful translation. Yeah. So I thought double entender. 
Well, how would you do that? But that's beautiful. <laughs> There's so much here. I'm telling you, Chaitanya Jaranji, there is so much. I'm very excited about it, but I have to restrain myself because yes. I can't get everything in one talk. So we I should probably wind up now. Yes, true. Cool. Still, your heart is limited by your body. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yes. Here we go again, right? Yeah. Should I try to summarize quickly? Please. Yeah. So, uh, this was a thrilling discussion. We discussed about broadly the topic of from yoga to bhakti. So, <clears throat> we started about our yoga and bhakti, two distinct traditions that originated. So, you talked about how yoga is almost prehistorical in the inter beyond our human history to know. The historical eye can only see so much and see so deep. But the reality is much bigger. So, but even in whatever texts you do have, uh, wherever it's available, you know, yoga is uh, not just talk, yoga, you give the one metaphor, which I think we used a lot of, uh, like a toolbox. So yoga is difficult to define because it involves various kinds of practices and various conceptions of perfection also. But even the Rig Veda mentions about people who resemble yogis. So there is that description. And then, of course, the Bhagavatam has the philosophical description of yoga in the 3rd and 11th cantos and also the practice of some limbs of yoga, at least, by many of the major characters over there. So then from there, uh, how yoga is described historically, we came to today. You talk about how yoga spread you know, in India also. Buddha, Buddha, it is not that it's come from China. It's very much from India. Buddha practiced it in India. Then it went eastward. And then afterwards, it went westward. So from that toolkit, throughout history, different people have taken different things. And each tool has its value, but the toolkit has its original purpose. So if somebody wants to fix, their back is aching and they want to fix their, get the, say if you consider yoga as harmony or connection, then get the back to work in harmony with the rest of the body. Yeah. That's also what yoga offers. So yoga can connect us, connect Union or connection, union means to bring various together, parts together in a whole, in a harmonious way. So that can happen at various levels. And this is, this is good at one level, whatever people are benefiting. Now, the, it becomes uh, yoga, however, can do yoga when we make that part as the absolute. When we do that alone and reject everything else. So then, like if somebody, if you, the other metaphor uses, if somebody strengthens their one arm or just upper part of the body and neglects everything else, then in seeking the health of one part, they may damage the rest of the body. So like that, the, uh, like that yoga can lead to yoga. But if people want to use it as a toolkit, then within yoga, yoga itself, there is the something which uplifts. So a person mm -hmm. practices yoga and then they feel some kind of, there's something special. There's something more over here. Yes. And to some extent, that, that there is even the yoga the yoga teaching is moving toward that holistic under toward that holistic understanding by talking about not just the physical postures but also the philosophy and uh, the broader worldview and then we talk about how yoga is meant to heal it's like a car that has been damaged the wheels have been damaged because of a pothole so like our 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 inner being becomes damaged but the chakras get this get uh, you see what is it? within the chakras get buried the vasanas the samskaras and the kleshas. Yeah. And yoga is meant to free those so that our energy can come forth, and yes. we can function at a more wholesome level. And then from that point, we disc we move forward to the whole I think the metaphor of the embrace. So as we move for you, we talk about yoga, and. Uh, so we connect, we bring the part together with the whole. So there can be different conceptions of the whole as a person moves forward. And there is the, so there can be yoga at the level of sat. Everyone understands the eternity of one's existence. They can yoga at the level of chitta. And then there's yoga at the level of ananda. So therein, uh, I think there was a significant discussion about the point that when, when people are practicing yoga, at that time, it is uh, the it is the Lord reveals Himself the way they conceive. So Ishvara 
is to translate as god is just people think of him as a creator but in the bhakti tradition creation is outsourced subcontracted as you said <laughs> so then within so you krishna is much much more than the creator and uh, there is with the description of ishwar ishwar pranidhan comes several times so talk about going deep within the heart so with respect to that you talk about the yoga practices the lung, angas of yoga can be understood at a at a practical level at a partial level and at a, at a partial practical and then at a perfective level so at a partial level they are universal we talked about this all of the yamas and niyamas all of them are universal and yamas and niyamas are not do's and don'ts but they are more of social interaction rules for uh, guidelines for social interaction and guidelines for so- individual discipline mm-hmm. and then the postures the breathing so we all go inward and the idea of pratyahar is not just not taking ahar from outside not just doing the opposite of taking ahar from outside will in a complete sense taking ahar taking food from inside getting nourishment by drawing out what is within and then the further states so you talk about levity like throwing up your daughter so we want to we all want to free ourselves from the limitation of our beings so even somebody who goes bungee jumping and things like that which may not seem at all like samadhi but people are experiencing something over there even in art even in sports but the deepest level of freedom from the limitations of our being when we go that's when we go deep into our heart and when we so then we talk about the heart heart is not just the biological heart it is actually it's not even mentioned from the in the in the anatomy of our being from the atma to the from the ahankar to the the indriya so it is actually within the within the atma is the deepest level of our being where so when we there is the outflow emotion and then you said in motion was it is they go out and go in yeah in motion right in motion so mm-hmm. that reciprocation so when the deepest we go into the heart that's when depending on what kind of samskaras are there within the person they will perceive the ultimate reality to be accordingly so but if somebody has purified themselves then that ultimate reality is revealed to be krishna mm-hmm. and then you talk about first we realize the ultimacy of the reality and then we talk about the intimacy of that real intimacy of that being so bhakti yoga is so, so that ultimate being is always embracing us so bhakti so yoga is also increasing awareness and then increasing gratefulness to all the gifts that we have to how our existence depends on so many things which are beyond our com- comprehension also level on control like how seven trillion cells in our body each has millions of activities going on what can we control in that what can we even know so that is and then as we become grateful it's like we want to know who it is somebody keeps giving us gifts we want to know who is the person giving us the gifts yes uh, and then nice the idea that uh, there is when it is thought that the that the ultimate reality is is non is impersonal actually it's not impersonal non personal so if somebody may be attracted more to the magnificence of the mansion then the actual resident owner of the mansion so they are not being impersonal they are more non personal so the so the yogi so shukadev goswami the kumaras were more non personal so that's something like brahmavadis and then from there once you see the person then you fall in love with the person completely so the sat level of realization is also one valid level of realization however there is more in that also mm. and then we talked about the idea that ishvara is non the ishvara is not a reciprocator that is because the word graha you played with the word graha and talked about anugraha so that the word graha is very much there and the, when the ultimate ishvara that is so uh, there is some prasapragya samadhi but beyond that is a it's not a sapragya it's beyond that is ishvara that's right ishvara is a object like no other object so in that sense we are going beyond 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 all ordinary things or all ordinary beings to that supreme being in our meditation and then yoga chitta vritti roda that was you could say the in uh, in cricket india cricket is very popular so they say the match winning sixer <laughs> <laughs> yeah the climactic moment yeah the climactic moment so yeah. let me see if i get the translation so yoga chitta vritti roda is that the conditioned 
that the perfect there is the transformation of consciousness by which the conditioned turning becomes uprooted and then the pure turnings can take root and then flower so nirodha is both ways yes that's that negative and positive yes yeah, yeah, magnificent yeah. so thank you very much did i miss out anything you want to add any concluding words i think you summarized everything beautifully as usual chaitanya charanji it's been a pleasure really and an honor thank you oh thank you very much it's a very enriching always enriching talking with you but today it's this enriched understanding of yoga as well as the enriched understanding of bhakti you could say yeah, so yeah. thank you very much hari krishna thank you hari krishna